Welcome to A Word Fitly Spoken, a podcast about Jesus, His Word, and our joy in following Him. I'm Michelle Leslie. And I'm Amy Spreeman. You know, in this episode, we are going to take on more of your theological questions for us in part two of Glad You Asked. Michelle, I think these are among my favorite episodes because we get to dig into scripture to see what God's word has to say about life, home, family, and relationships, not only with other Christians, but uh, with a world that desperately needs a savior. Yeah, I really love these ep- episodes, too, for all of those reasons and, and more. Um, you know, I, f- I kind of feel when we answer these questions, I feel a little bit like the, the biblical version of Dear Abby, you know, <laughs> praise God, we don't have to come up with these answers out of our own knowledge and experience. We can rely on God's word to give us the answers that we know are right. We don't have to guess at whether we're right or not. We can right. rely on God's word. So that's really great. Well, just to remind our listeners about what kinds of questions that we take on, here are the questions that we answered last time in part one of Glad You Asked. First question was, how should a Christian wife respond when her husband abandons her? Next, what is is biblical femininity, not biblical womanhood, but biblical femininity? That was a fun question to answer. Um, Yeah, how how can new Christians be equipped to train up their children? What to do when church members block you on social media. If a church's worship team leads in songs from Bethel or Hillsong, etc., is that grounds for looking for a different church? And finally, I was recently diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. Is this just a sin? That was, I wasn't. That was what one of our uh, listeners asked. So those were some interesting questions to take on, and, uh, and we did in part one. And then, of course, you know, in addition to sort of like advice questions, we also take questions about the Bible, uh, how scripture applies to various situations, uh, current events, our take on the latest happenings in evangelicalism, and, and so on. Anyway, we weren't able to get to all of your questions last time, so tonight in part two, we're going to take on some more of those. That's right. And here is the first question. This one came from um, an Instagram uh, private message from uh, somebody who wanted to be anonymous. And she asks, what is your advice to a wife or mom who is spiritually more mature than her husband? And also when he says he is a Christian, but is not fulfilling the spiritual leadership role in the family, it can be exhausting. A lot of times and encouragement is greatly needed. Well, let us encourage encourage you, Anonymous. Uh, Here are my thoughts. Uh, The first part of your question is, what if the wife is more mature than her husband? Well, oftentimes that does happen. You know, one person will have her eyes opened first, and then she seems to be walking in step with God, or more discerning, perhaps, than her husband. Uh, That sort of happened with uh, my husband and I about 20 years ago, when we, as uh, very new and nominal professing believers, we were just kind of going along and not really reading God's Word, showing up at church, thinking we were good to go, all that stuff that uh, people sometimes do at first. But then I was invited to join a women's Bible study and being fed the gospel and solid doctrine from the word while my husband was not getting the same meal. And that was just for a season. Thankfully, it didn't last long, but you know, and those things happen. We grow at different rates. So my advice to anyone in that situation is just to have conversations about what you are learning in your Bible study or uh, from the Word. Share your excitement with him and ask him if he'd like to read something from the Word that you found. Uh, You might say something like, honey, check this out. I never noticed this before. What do you think? And then have him read, you know, if if he's willing to. But remember, you and I are not the Holy Spirit, right? So we cannot soften his heart. God does that. He does that just fine without us. But, uh, you know, the Word of faith comes by hearing, and so we want to make sure that we're giving those opportunities. And as far as him leading you spiritually, ask him for that. Tell him what you'd love to have him do. You know, start small with maybe prayers before dinners. Uh, See if he's willing to read to the kids, maybe a Bible story at bedtime. Maybe you could even invite uh, some friends from church for dinner if you want to and have uh, them initiate conversations about the Bible or what the guys in the church are doing. And then Uh, My final word is just to be patient and be prayerful for him. Michelle, what are your thoughts on this one? 
I think that's really great advice, Amy. I was I was just thinking as you were um, as you were talking. I I read a book and when I was a teacher many many years ago, um, when I was teaching in the public school system, we had to read a, a certain book for professional improvement. And uh, one of the ideas in that book was catch them being good. In other words, don't just fuss at kids when they do something wrong, but when they do something right, be sure to praise them too. And that came out of a secular book, but really that's a biblical truth. The Bible is very clear that we're to encourage one another. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to say is, yes, as, you're, as, you're, as you ask your husband to do certain things, like the ones that Amy was listing, when he when he gets something right, encourage him, affirm him, help him, you know, ask him uh, if there's anything that you can do to help him or to make things easier for him to lead and really, really be his biggest cheerleader and and be sure that you're not just complaining when he, you know, does something wrong or doesn't lead or doesn't do things the way you think he ought to or whatever. But really, when he does something, even if it's not perfect, be sure you encourage him and tell him how much you appreciate him trying or, you know, how much you appreciate some aspect of what he did, even if he got other aspects of it wrong. Um, another thing, you know, talk to your pastor, ask him for some advice. You know, he's a man. <laughs> if nothing else, he's yeah. a man. Hopefully he's also <laughs> a hope, good. Right? Yes. Yes. He better be a man. If not, don't talk to your he pastor, get a new church. <laughs> so um, Run. yes, talk to your male doctrinally sound pastor <laughs> and get some good counsel from him. Maybe he can suggest some uh, things that that your husband can get involved in like men's ministry or men's Bible studies or, or men's, uh, you know, a man to disciple him one-on-one -on -one, or even just spending time, you know, working on a project or fellowshipping with spiritually mature older men. And then another thing is, is, uh, try to have this perspective, realize that this situation, this isn't just about God growing your husband, but it's also about God sanctifying you as you deal with this. Um, so, you know, I, I know I always have the, the tendency to think, Lord, would you please do thus and so in, to grow my husband? But I never think about how God is growing me uh, in patience and hopefully he's growing me in patience in those situations and, and, uh, and, and being a better servant and things like that. So try to focus on that too. And so that's, that would be my, my advice to our listener. Yeah, very good. Good word. Thank you. Okay, next, I'm going to take two questions that I think I can answer fairly briefly. First, um, Pan Cha, who's a follower on Instagram, she asks this. She says, do you happen to have a teaching on the book of Job or maybe recommend one? Well, I have not. I've written a lot of Bible studies, um, but I haven't written one on the full book of Job. I've got two or three standalone lessons here and there on certain chapters in Job, but that's it. And Amy, correct me if I'm wrong, but I checked your Bible studies website, naomistable.com. Everybody be sure to go visit over there. And, uh, and we'll have that link for you in the show notes. But I visited over there and I did not see a study on Job. You aren't hiding one in the back stock room or anywhere, are you? <laughs> no, um, I'm, I'm sort of like Costco. You know, you don't, there's no back storeroom at all. So <laughs> you, it's out there. Um, I've done Bible studies on Job myself through church, but this is such a great idea. So we might want to do a Bible study on Job in the future. Yeah, that might be a good idea. Yeah, I always say I'm I'm not Walmart. I don't have every I don't have anything in the back store room. I, everything I have is out on the shelves. So <laughs> what you see is what you get when you go to michellelesley.com. Um, so, but one, one study I would definitely not recommend is Lisa Harper's study on Job. If you're not familiar with Lisa, she is a false teacher, unfortunately. And if you'll go to my blog, michellelesley.com and put her name in the search bar, you can see why she's a false teacher. And you can also read the review I wrote on the first lesson of her study in Job. And just suffice it to say, it's no bueno. Just don't go there. Uh, you know, I'm sure there are some good studies on Job out there, but I would really encourage you to simply pick up your Bible, turn to Job 1-1, and start reading for yourself. Don't depend on somebody else to tell you what it says. Don't depend on somebody else's study. Study it and find out for yourself. 
Now, you might want to invest in a good study Bible like the MacArthur Study Bible or the ESV Study Bible or the Reformation Study Bible. Those are some good ones. But even then, study the text for yourself first and then read the study notes to clarify anything you didn't understand. It's it's kind of like, um, you know, I was thinking about this the other day. It's kind of like when we had, you know, I don't know if they still have these or not, like math textbooks in school, or the, is everything computerized now, or do they still have math they textbooks? They must be. It's been years, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, Amy, I don't, I don't know about you, but when I was in school, it, in the math, some of the math books would, um, you know, you could turn to the back, and they would have the correct answers for some of the oh, problems, yeah. not not all of them, but some of them. And you could, you know, those those answers were not in the back for you to just copy down the correct answer. Those answers were in the back for you to do the problem on your own first and then check to make sure that you had done it right by checking the answer in the back of the book. And so that's kind of the same idea here with study Bibles. Read the, the material first for yourself. Do your best to understand it yourself on your own and then read the study notes in case anything, you know, was confusing to you. So, yeah, <clears throat> one point on that, Michelle, I would say, too, um, because I've been in Bible studies where uh, the women will say, well, according to John MacArthur, it, you know, and we're trying to study the Bible and, mm-hmm. and, and not interject and just study the word, um, the Holy Spirit works through the word, right? And so right. Um, if you cheat and just read the Cliff's notes or somebody else's thoughts about it, I mean, th- those thoughts are great, but that's not the Holy Spirit working in you. So so he wants right. to open your eyes and reveal his truth through scripture. So yeah, I agree with 100% with that. Right. And it's so amazing when the Holy Spirit does that. Don't cheat yourself out of that experience by, you know, just depending on somebody else to tell you what the word says. I mean, you know, if you think about it, this is what was going on in Catholicism when the Reformation happened. The guardians of the word were the Pope and the priests and everybody, and the common people just had to, they didn't have uh, copies of the word in their own language, and they just, and they weren't, in many cases, they were not allowed to have a copy of the Bible for themselves. Uh, Of course, this, you know, that depended on the printing press and all that too. But, you know, there, they were, there was this just very strict thing that the priests and the Pope and all the head honchos in Catholicism, they were the guardians of the word. And the common people had, they didn't have any access to the word except what those people told them that it said. And as we know, a lot of what they were told was wrong. Now, I'm not saying that about John MacArthur and people like that, obviously, because they are doctrinally sound. But it's the same idea. We shouldn't be depending on people for every little bit of the word that we get. We should be able to study the word on our own. So and and then plus, it's it's always fun to to study the word pick up on a certain point and then see one of your heroes of the faith, like John MacArthur or somebody make the same point in his sermon or, or whatever. And speaking of sermons, that's another thing that you can do. Once you've finished studying a particular passage, there are two really good websites you can go to. You can go to gty.org, which is John MacArthur's website or ligonier.org, which is uh, started by RC Sproul. That was his, his ministry. And then look and see if there are any sermons or, or articles or devotions or Bible studies or anything like that on those websites. And after you're finished studying the passage for yourself, then read those materials and see what conclusions they came to, to check and make sure you got the right answer, kind of like we were talking about with the with the math book. So that's how I wanted to answer that question. Amy, you have anything else on that? No, I think you covered it. Okay. Well, the next quickie question I wanted to address came uh, came in via Instagram through a direct message. So we'll keep this this person anonymous. And she says, could you touch on the book Redeeming Love being made into a movie? It's a book that so many Christian girls are reading and they really shouldn't because they really shouldn't be reading it because it's so explicit. And now it's being made into a movie. Not only did we receive this question about Francine Rivers' book and movie, Redeeming Love, in response to our call for Glad You Asked questions, but a lot of my followers have been asking me about this as well. Amy, have you gotten any questions about this? I haven't. I've been tagged in a few okay. posts, though, to see what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I have, too. So, but I've, I, the questions have just been pouring in. I mean, I've just, I got, I think I got two more questions about this today, just on social media. Um. So 
So we've gotten all these questions about this. So girls, because I love you, I bit the bullet because I really don't like romances, secular or Christian. And I checked the book out of the library. I finished reading it a couple of days ago, and I'm going to see the movie this coming weekend. And I will either write a review of the book and movie on my blog, or Amy and I will address it in an upcoming episode and and talk about whether young girls should see this or not or you know any issues with the movie the book whatever now i do want to clarify that when the lady who sent in the question said that christian girls really shouldn't read the book because it's explicit i just want to clarify that's her opinion and her recommendation not mine i'm not saying i disagree with her i'm not saying i agree with her i'm just saying I finished the book and I have some thoughts that will probably not please everybody, which, you know, surprise, surprise. But uh, I'm waiting until I've seen the movie to comment on both the book and the movie in the same article or podcast. I don't want to, you know, I don't want to be premature, you know, in, in expressing my opinions on that. So the only thing I will say at this point is that I would just encourage everyone to look up the words explicit and implicit in the dictionary so that you fully understand the difference between those two words and their meanings. So that's all I'm going to say about that. Amy, anything you'd like to add on either of those questions? Well, um, if we're going to do a review, I know that uh, Redeeming Love the Movie is in our area for the next week. Um, By the time this podcast airs, it's no longer going to be here. But uh, So if I get a chance and if we do decide to go forward and review things, um, I might do that. I haven't been to a movie theater in a few years, but uh, I want to make sure, too, though, that it's not too sexually... Uh, charged if it's if it's something like that that's something that I probably wouldn't do so um so I'm gonna wait I'm gonna wait and see what uh I test the waters a little bit look do a little more research before I decide if I'm gonna do that all right so the next question we have moving along comes from um, Nikki and this comes from uh, Michelle you got this one on Facebook how as a disabled stay-at-home mom can I be more of a servant of God? I have days or weeks at a time that I can't get out of bed, and when I'm able, that energy goes towards my home and children. And then she also writes, I'm divorced because of abuse, and and I'm still able, oh, she asks this question, am I still able to go to heaven? Great questions. Um, first of all, yes, you are still able to go to heaven if you are regenerated by the Lord Jesus. If you're not sure, uh, Michelle and I have a menu tab called Good News, and it's over on our website at a awordfitlyspoken.life. And I encourage you to go and read that pray, page and uh, just pray about, you know, am, am I saved? And, and here's what the word has to say. Um, you do not lose your born again status because you have have been divorced. And I am so sorry to hear that you were abused. Uh, we were, are, we're going to pray that the Lord has brought you through that with his healing mercy and grace, and that he continues to help you in your time of need, um, especially when the memories of those things come up, as I'm sure they still do. But let's talk about your disability that you mentioned. Um, you can definitely be a servant and uh, do God's will, even if you're unable to get out of bed or, you know, if you're wheelchair bound or if you're only awake a few hours a day, whatever it is, you can serve and love him with your heart, your soul, your mind, your body, all your strength, even if you uh, feel like you don't have a lot of it right now. Be in the word first and foremost and share it with those that the Lord has placed in your path through his providence. Caring for your children in your home. That is your main mission field. And after that, it's whomever that you have in your extended family, like your neighbors, uh, your friends, uh, everyone needs Christ. And you can minister to them and encourage them and exhort them and love them. Michelle, uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Well, I just want to echo everything that you said. And one thing that I thought of as you were talking about being in the word is that if if you don't have the strength to hold your Bible or whatever, or, you know, you can't, you've got to keep your eyes closed because, you know, you're in pain or something like that, you can listen to the word um, on on a Bible app. And there's lots of good ones out there. Uh, that And that may be very comforting to you and, and strengthening to your spirit. Um, but de- uh, uh, depending on what 
I can't get out of bed means, I, I don't know, does that mean you have difficulty walking, but you're otherwise okay? Or are you sleeping all the time? Or if you're in constant excruciating pain and you can't do anything, it's kind of hard to say because there, there are some cases where you could do more things being in the bed than other cases. So, so that's kind of hard to say. But one thing I would just mention is just to be a prayer warrior. Um, that's something that you can do with your eyes closed, lying down in your mind. You know, you don't have to expend a lot of energy on that. You don't have to move a lot if that's painful for you. Think about, you know, ask God to bring, bring people to your heart and to your mind that you need to pray for. Pray for your family, pray for your church, pray for your friends, um, you know, pray, pray about things that are going on in the world. Um, think about our episode last week, pray for an end to abortion and pray that the people who are working against abortion will be successful and things like that. Um, you know, another thing that you can do is you can study scripture like we were talking about. You can memorize scripture. That's also something you can do with an audio Bible or, you know, just a Bible app. So that's something that you don't have to, um, hopefully you don't have to move a lot. You don't have to read a lot, but just go verse by verse, you know, pick a passage and, or some verses and start memorizing those. Uh, if you're able, you know, have your children come into the bedroom and just sit around on the bed with you. If, if that's a possibility and teach the word to them, that's my goodness. That's a great mission field right there. You know, you were supposed to raise our children up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. So do that. Um, if you're able to write, write, you know, start a blog <laughs> if you want to, or, or, you know, write some encouraging, um, call, uh, cards to people in your church or make some encouraging phone calls, things like that. Just kind of, kind of brainstorm some things that you can do without, I don't know, moving too much or without being in too much pain and things like that. There are things that you can do. And if nothing else, you can definitely be a prayer warrior. We def definitely, desperately need more prayer warriors. And then I would just echo what Amy said about the divorce. Divorce isn't the unforgivable sin. Um, if your husband initiated the divorce, it wasn't even your sin. It was his sin. Um, and even if you initiated it, depending on what the circumstances were, it may or may not have been a sin. I don't know the details. But yes, definitely go to our Go to a word fitly spoken dot life and click on good news and uh, and make sure that you know what the gospel is and that you believe it. Okay, here's the next question, and this is from the Addies on I think that's a family on Instagram, and I just love this question. They said, "What does forgiveness really mean biblically? Is repentance from the offending person required for the offended to forgive?" And like I said, I really loved this question because it just dragged me down into the depths of scripture. And I had just a good little Bible study time answering this question. So thank you for asking this question. Um, you might want to get comfortable because it's kind of a long answer. <laughs> so here we go. I, I'm going out for a sandwich. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Let's look at what scripture has to say. And just an interesting little tidbit. I mainly use the ESV. And in the ESV, the words forgive, forgiven, forgave, and forgiveness occur 114 times. 53 times in the Old Testament and 61 times in the New Testament. And that's, you know, not really all that important. I just always think it's interesting, you know, to find out how, how many times something is mentioned. So, but let's, we're not going to look at all 114 of those passages tonight. That's not why this is long. We're just going to look at one passage that's kind of long in and of itself. This is the, the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, and it's really helpful here. Um, so it's, like I said, it's a little bit long, but as I'm reading, listen for the actions of the people in the story. And you may want to just hit pause right now and go grab your Bible so that you can follow along. So this is going to be Matthew 18, 21 through 35. Here we go. Matthew 18, 21. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times, or some, some of your versions may have 70 times seven. Verse 23, therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. 
So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, Pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me, and, sh and should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. <clears throat> Okay, so let's zero in on the king's actions in verse 27 there. It says this, it says, And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Okay, so what did the king do? Well, first, he had compassion or pity for the servant who had gotten himself into something he could not get out of. And that's always the case when someone sins against us. She's done something that she can't undo. I mean, she might be able to apologize or even make some sort of restitution, but she can't go back in time and not sin against you so that things are the same way they used to be. She, that's impossible. So first we have compassion on those who are stuck in an impossible situation. We show them mercy. All right. What did the king do next? Next, the king released the servant. He sort of unstuck him, so to speak, from this impossible situation. I'm not going to hold you captive to this situation of your wrongdoing anymore. I'm going to set you free from it and let you go. And then finally, the king forgave the servant's debt. He surrendered his right to exact payment from the servant, and he absorbed the loss himself. He, he zeroed out the account. He marked the bill paid in full. He said, we're good. We're square on this. That's what he did. Now, just to drive the point home here, look at how the servant demonstrates the exact opposite unforgiveness with his fellow servant. Look at verse 28. He found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii, and seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. He didn't release the debtor. He seized him. He didn't give up his right to exact payment from his fellow servant. He tried to extract payment through the guy's neck, I guess, by choking him and demanding payment. All right, verse 29. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. And look at this point of this. There's just a point for point antithesis of compassion, release and forgiveness of debt in verse 30, the exact opposite of those things in verse 30. First of all, it says he refused. Okay, the servant that was choking the guy, he refused. He refused to show compassion. Next, it says, and went and put him in prison. Okay, that's the definition of captivity and the opposite of release. Because if you're in prison, how are you going to work to earn money to pay your debt? You know, he keeps him stuck in this impossible situation of debt. So he refused. He went and put him in prison. And then it says, until he should pay the debt. So he says, I'm not going to absorb the lost loss. I'm not going to pay the cost. You're going to pay it. Even though you're stuck in this impossible situation where there's no way to pay it. And even if there were a way, you're incapable of paying that much. Isn't that an amazing illustration of what it means to forgive? We show mercy and compassion. We give up our right to make the person who sinned against us pay. And we set her free from captivity to the impossible situation of us being angry or hurt at her over something that she can't change. And look what's so amazing about this. This is amazing. Who's telling this story? Jesus is telling the story, right? He's the king in this story, the king of kings. 
And not too long after this, he's going to perfectly practice what he preached. He's going to have compassion on us because we are stuck in the impossible situation of having racked up an enormous sin debt against him that we have no way of ever paying off and no ability to pay off that much, even if there were a way. And that compassion is going to lead him to show mercy to us and provide us a way to get unstuck. He's going to go to the cross to release us and forgive our debt. He sets us free from being in captivity to our impossible state of indebtedness to him. And he doesn't just absorb the cost of our sin. He actually pays it with the currency of his own blood. He can mark the bill paid in full because he paid it himself. And that's why we forgive others, because Christ forgave us infinitely more. Now, in this story, both the first and the first servant and the second servant repented to the person he was indebted to. But what about someone who sins against you and doesn't repent? Can you still forgive her? Should you still forgive her? Well, let's go back to the text. Can you adopt a posture of mercy and compassion toward the person who sinned against you, even if she doesn't think she's done anything wrong, or even if she's not aware of your mercy and compassion? Yes, you can, because that mercy and compassion originate and live in your heart. It doesn't have anything to do with her as far as, you know, what you're doing. It's primarily an internal posture of the heart, whether you can pour it out externally or not. Okay, can you make the decision to set her free from your anger or hurt feelings? Yes. Again, that's an internal decision and attitude of the heart before it ever becomes an external action of responding to someone who repents. And finally, can you surrender your right to make her pay for what she's done? Yes, you can make that decision of the heart that her bill is paid in full and she no longer owes you. And one more scripture I'd like to add on that point, Romans 5, 6 through 8. This is so great. Listen to this. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person, one would even dare to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While you were still actively sinning against him, before you knew what sin was, before you understood you were a sinner, while you were a hater of God, as Romans 1.30 says, Christ died for you. He showed mercy and compassion to you. He provided a way out of your impossible situation. He paid your debt in full. Romans 2.4 says that that kindness is what led us to repentance. Now, you don't know whether your kindness in forgiving someone will ever lead that person to repent, but that part isn't your business. That's above your pay grade. Your pay grade is to obey God and forgive, and that's where your job stops. It's God's job to handle the results. And then just one final thing about this. Forgiving someone who's unrepentant does not require you to put yourself into situations with that person that allow him or her to keep on unrepentantly sinning against you. For example, we spoke about someone who is in an abusive marriage earlier. If you're in an abusive marriage, you can forgive your unrepentant husband while living somewhere safe. Scripture does not require you to move back in with him while he's still unrepentant and abusive and give him the opportunity to keep sinning against you. Another example, if your niece comes over to visit and steals your favorite earrings and she has not repented and she has not changed her ways, you can forgive her, but you don't have to invite her over to your house until or unless, you know, she repents and changes. You know, maybe you meet in a coffee shop to visit instead. Forgiveness doesn't require the other person to repent, but reconciliation does. Forgiveness is a one-man job reconciliation is a two-way street. You can't be reconciled to someone who refuses to be reconciled to you. So Amy, what say you on this one? 
I I am so blessed by this, Michelle, and so glad that you took the time to go through this. I feel like I've just done an entire devotional with Michelle Leslie, so uh, (laughs) for free. It was awesome. Uh, But great answers from God's Word. And I really like the idea of how you mentioned, you know, taking captive the every thought because if you truly forgive someone then you don't continue to uh you know allow these past behaviors or memories bubble up and make you miserable or angry or bitter uh you you release that person from captivity so very well done my friend and i I just really appreciate you All right. Well, the next question, this one is also from Anonymous. We get a lot of anonymous people, but that's cool. We'll we'll go there. Um, Anonymous from Instagram. And uh, if you've recently uh, moved and started at a church, she wants to know, and you've uh, joined the ladies for their weekly Bible study only to sit and watch a video sermon with no follow-up questions or comments or discussion about what you just watched, um, and, and then you ask, well, uh, what will we be studying next week? And, and then the pastor's wife prob- answers, probably another YouTube video. What do you say? I've asked if we could work through a book in the Bible, but was told that they tried it and a lady got offended and left the church. Okay. <laughs> I think I got that right. Um, first, we we really don't know why this person left the church, and you're pretty new, new so you probably don't even know who that was. It could have been uh, for a reason other than what you might assume, which was that maybe she was offended by the Word of God. Maybe maybe that's what you're thinking. Now, it sounds like uh, this women's Bible study possibly might not be grounded in Scripture if they're allowing you know YouTube videos to do all the heavy lifting of Bible teaching. So maybe this person person that uh, who left the church left because she was offended by some false teaching who knows the point really is if you're not being taught the word of god in your bible study class and if no questions are allowed how is anyone learning and should you continue to go that should be kind of the the real question i i'm not sure whose videos you're watching perhaps it's a really good teaching series um i don't know but i've long said that if you're doing a topical bible study outside of the bible stop calling it a bible study no one's studying the bible we're watching videos so Anonymous, you might want to do this. You might want to study the Bible for yourself or with a small group of like-minded women, either from your church or maybe, you know, outside from your community, or even, you know, join a weekly Bible study offered by another church down the street. You don't have to do it at your church necessarily. Um, So that's just, you know, kind of some initial thoughts. Michelle, do you have anything to add? I would totally agree with that. And I I would just backtrack just a little bit. This is why I would not advise someone to join a church without thoroughly checking it out first. Right. So ideally, you visit for a while, maybe at least a couple of months, you get involved, you you know, you see what's going on, and you find these things out before you join. Now, the lady who sent in the question said she had, quote, started at a church. I don't know if that means she just joined or if she's recently been visiting that church. So, hon, if you haven't joined yet, and this is a deal breaker for you, and there's an equally or more doctrinally sound church near you where this is not an issue, then maybe you go check out that church and and think about joining that one instead. Uh, another thought I had, she didn't say whether or not, like you you pointed out, she didn't say whether or not these sermon videos were doctrinally sound. If they are, then, you know, I personally, I would not enjoy going to a class that I'm thinking is a Bible study, and then we go in and watch a video, and that's it, and we leave. I, I wouldn't enjoy that, and so I can understand somebody else who doesn't like that, but... um but if they are doctrinally sound, then, you know, maybe you're like me and you just don't like that style of, of class and the way that it's being led. So maybe you just don't go to those classes. Like Amy said, maybe you find another class to go to uh, or something like that. You know, now this is assuming that your church is otherwise doctrinally sound, of course. Um you know, you if you're going to worship service and you're going to Sunday school or whatever, then you're you're getting fed the word, and you don't have to go to these classes. Um, 
But anyway, I've, if you've already joined, I really don't think this is something that you change churches over. You know, like I said, keep going to worship service, keep going to Sunday school, find another way to fellowship with the ladies. Like Amy said, maybe the church down the street is having a Bible study you could go to, or you could uh, have some of the ladies over for dinner, or you could go out for coffee or something like that. So those are just a few thoughts that I had. What's our last question there, Amy? Yeah, I did save this one for last um, because I want to address it. We get this from time to time, and we got it again this past week from um, an anonymous uh, person on um, Instagram, and she sent us a private message. So, um, uh, but but you know, again, we do get this from time to time. She says, "I'm looking forward to this episode. I wanted to ask regarding the teachings of Douglas Wilson. I've seen several things about him, both good and bad. What are your thoughts? Is his teaching of patriarchy biblical?" And my answer is, A, uh, I'm going to link up some of our teachings that uh, I really want our listeners to hear again, uh, some of our teachings that Michelle and I have done on patriarchy, uh, patriarchy, biblical roles of women, and the seepage of feminism into the church. That's huge. It is a poison. Um, but B, I have not studied the teachings of Doug Wilson. He's not one who's on my radar at the moment, uh, but I have seen solid, biblically sound people, friends of mine who I respect, who have greatly enjoyed the things that he has taught. And yes, I am aware that uh, there are some concerns that others have voiced about the patriarchy. Okay, I'm putting those in quotations because that's what they want to know about. And in fact, if you've seen things posted on social media, May I just encourage all of you to hold off on making a judgment call based on a meme, uh, which is really just a, a photograph with words on it, a meme which contains maybe a grainy photo of the pastor with uh, one of those cut and paste quotes that he has allegedly said. Um, I do have a warning to share with you about that. Uh, you see, for the past couple of years, there has been a group of very vocal women, uh, women who some of, some of them I've known personally, who have been influenced by feminist leftist ideologies. It's very clear uh, who have been talking about their deconstruction, who have been posting and sharing these alleged quotes from Wilson and his family members and his friends without proper attribution, by the way, just pasting their own uh, you know, text boxes that they've written without including any links to the actual teaching that's, in my opinion, that is just lazy yellow journalism. And what's worse is that uh, this particular group is attacking anyone who doesn't agree with them. It's really vile, sinful behavior that Michelle and I have actually tried to address with this group, but unfortunately they then target us as they're in their hate campaign for um, exhorting them to act humbly. And I know that just uh, by me saying this, uh, Michelle and I will probably get uh, a, a little bit more gossip and backbiting but uh, you know what? You'll know them by their fruits. So that's all I'm going to say about that. But back to the social media posts that you may have read about uh, Doug Wilson. Please don't take these photo image quotes, these memes as truth. Where does truth come from? You know where truth comes from, right? So instead, find out what, and this goes for any teacher, find out what the teacher actually said. Uh, you, you know, you might have to go listen to his sermon in context or read his book in context or go to uh, whatever article he actually wrote where this quote allegedly comes from. And yes, it takes time. But if you're going to be uh, doing your homework and being a good Berean, then you're going to have to actually put the time in to do that legwork. Um, you know, a Berean is is one who studies the scriptures to see if uh, you know the real authenticated quote would line up with scripture now Speaking of that slanderous group, uh, last week, the leader of the pack accidentally shared a screenshot uh, from a group uh, called, I think it's called something like Examining Doug Wilson or something like that. It's kind of a mean little site. Uh, but anyway, uh, she, she shared a screenshot from, uh, you know, to repost it. Uh, and, and by the way, this group is a, a Facebook and Twitter account that this particular person has denied that she leads. But oops, in that screenshot, she forgot to hide her name as the account administrator. Now, why does that matter? It sounds like a little thing, right? Well, it matters because lies 
matter. It matters to God. And it turns out that this leader of the pack has been deceiving her followers and the rest of the world. And and not only that, but she has damaged her credibility as a, a bastion of truth telling. So um, I am going to go on record to encourage you to mark and avoid any accounts like this and do your own homework instead. Uh, thoughts about that, Michelle? Um, Amy, I just, I agree with everything that you've said. You know, Doug Wilson is a very articulate writer. Um, I haven't read a whole lot of his nonfiction stuff, maybe just a few blog articles. I've seen a few videos of him being interviewed. Uh, I've seen, you know, his fans quoting him on social media and whatnot. Uh, And I've seen some of his articles um, explaining or answering some of these accusations that have been made against him. And I've thought they were very fair and reasonable. Um, But mostly what I've read is two of his novels. I've read Evangelifish and Ride Sally Ride. You know, in none of his stuff have I seen his serious stuff, you know, serious theological stuff like blog articles and things like that. I've never really seen anything directly from him that I disagreed with much, if at all. I have been listening to his wife Nancy's podcast for about three or four months now, and I have not heard her say anything unbiblical. So, I mean, if that's a reflection on him, then that seems to be a good sign. I am concerned about his use of vulgar and profane words, but this has been taken wildly out of context. A lot of the memes that Amy mentioned um, that I've seen are from his novel, Ride Sally Ride. And I read that book because I wanted to see for myself what all the accusations were about. I mean, it's like Amy was saying, you know, you need to go to the source uh, and and really read his his own words for you know that he said himself um it's it is not soft core porn this book that i this ride sally ride book um not by a long shot and although there were a few small parts in it that i found objectionable although most people probably wouldn't i mean i have a pretty low tolerance for, for vulgarity it wasn't anywhere near as luridly horrifying as as the I hate Doug Wilson crowd would have everyone believe. Overall, I thought it was a pretty decent contemporary Christian novel. The parts I objected to were not essential to the storyline, and they could have easily been deleted or changed without impacting the story at all. And that was really my main objection to those parts. It would have been just as easy to leave those parts out or to to use other words to say, you know, the things that he said, which as a pastor, and frankly, as a Christian, I think he should have done. I, I do not approve of, of, you know, using profanity at all. We, we did a whole episode on that not long ago, and uh, you, can, you can see what we said about that uh, and listen to what we said about that in that episode. But, um, you know, I, and I would say the same thing about his novel, his other novel that I read, Evangelifish, that there are some parts in that, not quite as striking as in Rod Sally Rod, but there were some similar parts in that that he could have changed, you know, that he didn't have to say them the way he said them. Um, I've seen the quotes, you know, the memes of the quotes from the book that Amy was talking about, and I find the quotes objectionable, but they're not representative of the book as a whole. Just like if, for example, if you've ever read Ezekiel chapter 23, that is not representative of the Bible as a whole. If the only part of the Bible you had ever read was Ezekiel 23, you would think God was disgusting and perverse because you're reading it out of context. You're not reading it in the context of the entire Bible. And that's the same thing that's going on with these these memes that Amy was talking about. They're just picking out a sentence or two and taking parts of the book out of context. For example, one of the memes with the most shock value contains a vulgar word for the female anatomy. I'm going to read that quote to you and don't don't worry, I'm not going to say the word, the vulgar word that's in it. Um, But then I'm going to explain to you a little bit about the context. And this is the quote. This is all that it says on the meme. It says, Stephanie lost her temper completely and totally and shouted, shouted at him, Lionel, I already have a vulgar word for the female anatomy. Insert that there. What makes you think I was in need of another one? Okay. I already have a blank. What makes you think I was in need of another one? Now, in case you don't even understand what she's talking about, uh, the character Stephanie in the book, the expletive she uses can also mean a weak man or a wimp. 
So she's calling him that vulgar word. Now, I'm not going to make any excuses for Doug Wilson's use of that word in his book. He's, he's a gifted writer. He could have found another way to write that line without the use of that word. But here's what I want to explain. Number one, this is an isolated incident in the book. I mean, I could be wrong, but as far as I can recall, it's been a few months since I read the book. As far as I can recall, that's the only time that word was used in the book. Number two, this is someone who lost her temper, and haven't we all lost our temper in, in, you know, in a moment of, of anger? Um, it's not someone whose language was constantly peppered with profanity. Number three, Stephanie, the character who said this line, was either, she was either lost or she was a brand new Christian at the time that she said this. I can't remember which one it was. And number four, almost, and this is what, this is part of the context that they don't tell you about in the meme, almost immediately after she said that, she expressed remorse and regret and she apologized. So, I'm not, you know, don't misunderstand me. I am not endorsing Doug Wilson or defending his book or defending his use of profanity or vulgarity, but I'm not warning against him either. What I'm trying to demonstrate to you is exactly what Amy was saying, that people with an agenda aren't usually the most reliable sources for objective information. If you want to know whether Doug Wilson or any other teacher is biblical or not, don't take somebody else's word for it. And that includes Amy's word for it or my word for it. Go find out for yourself. It's a skill every Christian needs anyway. You need to know how to vet teachers and materials and things like that. You need to know how to do discernment on your own. So compare his teaching and behavior to scripture and see what you find out. Draw your own conclusions. That's what we're all supposed to be doing anyway. So, uh, yeah, I just want to echo what Amy was saying. She's... She's absolutely right. And um, so if you're if you're concerned about a certain teacher, go do the work, go get your Bible out, you know, listen to the podcast, listen to the sermons, uh, read the, the books and whatever and compare everything to scripture. That is the bottom line. Well, I think that's going to wrap it up for this episode of A Word Fitly Spoken. You know, we love connecting with you and hearing your thoughts. So uh, don't forget to check out all the resources and links in our show notes and, and visit our website, awordfitlyspoken.life, uh, for this episode, for all the show notes and for all of our resources. And until next time, be in the word, love your neighbor, share the gospel, and walk worthy. <music>